Hello, folks. Welcome again to OCN. We're glad you tuned in. And today we're going to be talking about something that is dear to all of us, the fruit of our thoughts. That's right. <laughs> the fruit of our thoughts. God is also concerned with that very much. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> now, we are a three-part person. We are body, which you know, soul, our mind, our emotions, our intellect, and our will. We're three parts. Let me show you that from the scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Let's look at that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There we go. Spirit is who we are. Soul is our personality. It's attached to our spirit. And our body, we know about that. It's the outer man. The spirit is the inner man. And you might be interested to know that two out of three of those determines how we behave. That's right. If your body is sick, feel sick, and your spirit is discouraged, your soul will say, Oh, I don't feel well. I feel ill. And you will be because your body and your soul will agree together and your spirit's not strong enough to overcome them by itself. But if you have trained your soul to think like God thinks, you will say, oh, this is just a temporary thing. I command my body to line up with the Word of God. I am healthy. I am delivered from sickness and disease. Hallelujah. Then your spirit has trained your soul and to overcome the feeling of your body. And shortly, the body will line up with what your spirit and soul have agreed to. It's very important that we Think like God thinks. All right. Now, the main scripture, Jeremiah 6, verse 19. Let's look at that. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 19. The word of God is so good in these circumstances. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but have rejected it. So if you reject God's words as expressed in the Bible and reject his laws, God will bring upon you the fruit of your thoughts. And you may not want that to be brought upon you because your thoughts have not been clean or orderly. They have been confused many times. Now, let's look. What about people that have continuous wicked thoughts? Let's look over at Genesis 6, verse 5. These, that's in the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, Genesis 6, verse 5. The earth was young, mankind was young. And Adam and Eve had fallen into sin. Genesis 6, verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Oh, every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart 
was only evil continually. No wonder God brought the flood upon mankind to destroy wicked generation. Let's look over at Luke 17, verse 26. Luke 17, verse 26. All right, here we are. Luke 17, verse 26. Jesus is speaking. He says, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Namely, when Jesus comes back, just before he comes back, it's going to be like the days of Noah, where the thought, every imagination of man's heart was only evil continually. Now that is how the world thinks. This is not how God's people think. We are a new generation. We are delivered from that darkness into the glorious liberty of sons and daughters of God. And we don't have that problem of our thoughts being evil continually. We're delivered from that. We're a new species in the earth. We're homotheos, men of God, women of God. Hallelujah. Over in 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, and we won't read it, it's long, you have an idea of how the world is going to be in those days of the return of the Son of Man. That's right. Parallel, it says, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, proud, boasters, yeah, unthankful, disobedient to parents, unholy, and so forth and so on. And that's exactly what we're seeing in the world today. Therefore, we know, we know that the return of the Lord Jesus is very near, very near, because things are lining up for his return. Therefore, for us, we must prepare the way for him to come. That's right. We must strive to win souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let the fruit of our thoughts be souls that come to know Jesus Christ and are delivered from the culture of this world. Now, you can't hide thoughts from God. You may try, but it doesn't work. Matthew 12, 25 talks about that. Matthew 12, verse 25. God knows all of our thoughts. He knows them afar off. There we go, Matthew 12, 25. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. That's right. So if there's division, meaning disagreement, disunity, disharmony, that house or that family shall not stand. It'll fall. God knows all the thoughts. We must align our thoughts with the Word of God. That's right. Our thoughts must be aligned to this book. This expresses God's perfect will for man. Perfect will. If we align our thoughts to the Bible, how do we do that? by reading it and putting it into our hearts. Not just reading, but making an effort to remember what we read and meditate on it. Meditate, if we don't understand, meditate the Word of God and the Holy Spirit will explain to you 
what he meant by that. So you can't hide thoughts, evil thoughts, from God. Psalm 139, verse 2, spells that out clearly also. Psalm 139, verse 2. Okay. Now this psalm is a psalm of God knowing us from when we were created in our mother's wombs. Verse 2 says, Thou knowest my down-sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. God knows the motive for the thought. He understands afar off. You can't fool God by saying, well, God, I didn't mean this. God says, I understand the motive for that thought. It's not right. Repent. Then we must do so right away. Now, our bodies are God's house. It's for him to dwell in. This is the latter temple, if you will. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Over in Haggai, the Lord talks about the latter house. That is a house for God. A house not made with hands. Inside us, it's his house. That's right. I want to turn to that a moment. Haggai, just before Zechariah, chapter 2. It says, verse 9, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, says the Lord of hosts. God isn't talking about a physical location of something made with bricks and stone and glass and all that stuff and mortar. No, he's talking about in this latter house, in you, will I give peace. Because even in the, every temple, there wasn't peace. In Herod's temple, where Jesus cast out the thieves who sold doves and the merchants and all that, there was no peace there. Jesus made a whip of cords and drove the animals out, drove the thieves out. That's not peace. And in the millennial temple, He's not talking about that. He's talking about your bodies, the temple of the Holy Spirit, God's house. There's peace. God can bring peace to that house. Even in the midst of wartime, God can bring peace. Praise the Lord. Our bodies are God's house. Proverbs 24, verse 9 says, Even the thought of foolishness is sin. If you think foolish things, even the very thought is sinful. That's right. Matthew 15, verse 19 and 20, talk about evil thoughts defiling a person. It doesn't have to be an act that defiles you. It can be your thinking, your thoughts defile you. Thoughts of adultery, fornication, uh, thievery, drunkenness, this and that, stealing. Those thoughts defile you. That's right, even thoughts. And the thoughts of a person are to God are as clear to him as the acts. Even if that person doesn't commit those acts, those thoughts are equal to committing that act. That's why we need to repent of wrong thoughts. Repent. Now, the mind that produces those thoughts, our minds do. Our mind forms the thoughts in our brain by establishing new connections called sprouting. That's right, sprouting between dendrites and axons with synapses between them. You don't want to have a whole field of 
new synapses which sprout, which are defiled. Now, the enemy also can see those thoughts. And he knows when you think them. He can see the sprouts in your brain. Therefore, when you repent, those sprouts die. They're erased from your brain. They are no longer there. So your brain, even your brain, has to be cleaned, cleansed. So what you do is you ask God when you repent from wrong thoughts, and you know when you've been thinking them, you repent and ask God to forgive you and cleanse your brain from all visible sins in the brain. That's right. Because of the thoughts that you have had. Now, these connections which I'm speaking about can be made by focusing your thoughts for at least 10 minutes on a subject. 10 minutes will establish new connections in your brain. You want to erase those right away by repentance. How then should we live? Over in Hebrews 4, verse 12, it talks about that a little bit. Hebrews 4, verse 12. Let's have a look at that. Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living, alive, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It discerns between spirit and soul. If your spirit is born again, and you have soulish thoughts which do not line up with the Word of God, evil thoughts, the Word of God will show you, hey, this is not right. This is not consistent with your profession of faith in Jesus Christ. You aren't thinking like a believer. You're thinking like the world. When that happens, you realize it right away. Repent and ask God to forgive you and break off those bad connections in your brain. That's right. And when you think of God's thoughts, his word, it also establishes new connections in your brain, holy, right connections in line with what God wants you to think about. Sacrificing yourself for others, loving Jesus, serving the Lord with gladness all the days of your life, Rejoicing in good health, which he has granted you. Confidence in the fact that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You are not to be under the enemy, but over him. You can tell him where to go, and he will. He must obey you. You are like God in many cases, according to your faith. That's right. We should live that way. Submit our thoughts to the Word of God, which is able to discern the intents of the heart. Proverbs 16, verse 3 has another saying in there. Let's look at that a moment. Proverbs 16, verse 3. Very important scripture. Commit your works unto the Lord, and your thoughts shall be established. Whoa. If you commit your works to the Lord, your thoughts will be established. The Lord will establish the right thoughts for the, for the carrying out of that work. 
you consecrate your work to the Lord, and he will establish your thoughts concerning that work. Whatever that work is, if it's a direct command from him, or if it's something that he has put in your heart for someone else, he will establish those thoughts if you commit that work unto him. Psalm 37, verse 5, says something similar. Psalm 37, verse 5. Let's have a look at that a moment. <clears throat> Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. When you commit your way unto the Lord and trust in him, he will bring those thoughts to pass. That's right. Now, you may say within yourself, well, how do I know that God approves of this or agrees with this? How do I know that that's not my own thinking, my own spirit thinking that? Well, folks, let me tell you, if you have a will to do God's will, and if you're born again, born from above, most of the thoughts which you have are God's thoughts, not your own thoughts. But he has put those things in your heart, and, and you have nurtured them there. You have held them there in your heart, not knowing it. But all of a sudden, those thoughts are not your thoughts. Those are God's thoughts. Your heart has been a breeding ground for God's thoughts. That's right. God rebuked me one time because I asked him, Lord, was that thought my thought or was that yours? He said, son, most of what you think in your spiritual status right now, most of what you're thinking are my thoughts. I put them there. They're me. You don't, you don't have to ask me. Oh, that set me free. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. That means that normally I don't think my own thoughts. I think his thoughts. Yeah, I do have some thoughts that I think are my thoughts. But if they are not God's thoughts, they may not be fruitful. They may, or they may produce wrong fruit. They may be good, but the timing may not be there. Therefore, a good work is not necessarily for me to do at this time. It'll be better if I wait till God sets it time in time. And God will tell you. He won't keep you ignorant. If you want to do his will, he'll show you the timing. And you'll just know it. It's a knowing that you have. You don't have to ask, God, shall I act now? You'll just feel, I've got to do something. And you will. That's his urging. Praise the Lord. Now, sometimes we have thoughts which are not from God. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Verse 4 and 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Oh, we can take captives of our thinking? Yes, we can. We can, we can take those evil thoughts captive and cast them out of our minds. Take them captive, cast them out of our minds. Every thought that does not exalt the Lord Jesus, but exalts you. Every thought that 
put you on the throne of your life instead of Jesus, that thought should be cast out. That's right. Now, Philippians 4, verse 8, tells us the things that we should focus on. Philippians 4, verse 8. Now, these are the things that God, God approves of. There we go. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are, are pure, pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those are positive thoughts. Those are God's thoughts. They have good fruit, fruit that we can only imagine because God produces a rich crop from our thinking his thoughts. It's amazing. God's thoughts. Over in Isaiah 14, verse 24, God has sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. As God thinks, he'll bring it to pass. That's right. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says that God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts, but, and his way is higher than our ways, but we can walk in them. We can walk in them and think them. Higher thoughts. Forgiveness is higher than vengeance. Always. Jeremiah 29, 11 God's thoughts toward uh, us are peace, not of evil, to give us a hope and a future. Let's align our thoughts with God's thoughts, shall we? Let's be to God a nation of godly thinkers and godly doers in the name of Jesus. Amen.